Hi, friends. <laughs> um, I grew up in Chicago in a neighborhood called High Park in a six-flat apartment, two black families, two white families, two mixed families. And I always thought growing up, of course, I'm going to have mixed kids because that's like just what you do. And um, so and I was, this was in the 80s. Um, and I went to a private school where the Obamas sent their kids. And in seventh grade, I transferred to the public school, which is like Farrakhan's kids and R. Kelly and I think 90% black and a lot of fucked up tracking. And excuse me, there are kids <laughs> um, in the room. <laughs> Sorry about that. And, um, but it, this was the 80s and hip hop kind of like golden age of, I was trying to break, I was a really bad break dancer, really serious graffiti writer, and all my friends were like hip hop people. And um, I got arrested seven times by the time I was 14. And I was in front of the judge, I was like the only white person in any of the court. I went to court for like a year. I was also the only one with a lawyer, because my uncle. and. Um, and they were like, we don't put white kids in the Audi home. And um, as I got older in high school, and um, my white friends who did drugs got in trouble, and I got in trouble, and my black and Latinx friends, um, we got taken care of. We got second chances. And uh, my, my friends didn't get second chances. And I got sent back to private school. And I was, uh, I was burning with rage. I was like, who are all these spoiled kids? <laughs> like, they don't get it. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the library, and I was like, what can we do about this? And I was, you know, so I found Malcolm X and James Baldwin and Maya Angelou. I'm like, reading all these books and reading about movements in the 60s. Like, what do we do? <laughs> and f feeling just like... If it, was, if it was me, but I was born a mile in any direction, and I was black, I, I, would, be, I would be dead. I would be dead or in jail. And feeling like, I want this to change. I want my friends back. And like, I have to, like, what can I do about this? And that this has kind of been the journey of my life. Is, and so, so I was like, I was a, a writer and an artist, and I was like, I'm gonna do, <laughs> I'm gonna try to be like the white James Baldwin. I'm gonna, you know, I was, and it was like all these white people who think they're so wonderful, and like, you know, just like my parents and all the hypocritic liberal white people and me, and you know, <laughs> um, so I was like, so I was like, how do we get through to these white people? And um, so I was like, okay, I'm, so my, my kind of thing that I did, and I was like writing and speaking and I'm writing books, bomb the suburbs and no more prisons and how to get stupid white men out of office. If I was like, like traveling around on the circuit and basically what I would talk about is um, like, like this is how racist I am. Cause like I figure like if like, you know, and I'd be like, so anyway, this, I, I would try, try to like be dramatically vulnerable talking about all the evil things I could think of to talk about to like get other white people to look at ourselves um, and like really focus on like interpersonal psychological side of racism and um, and so I'm going to tell you the story of like the two hardest um, things on this journey. So I was doing this, and the New York Times started following me. This reporter from the New York Times, like, followed me around for a couple months, and was like, kind of like totally played me. <laughs> it was like, God, you're like the most anti-racist white person like alive, like you know. And, and I was like, No, I'm not. Let me tell you all the things wrong with me. So I'm just like, you know, like running down, like almost like exaggerating, you know, because like the worst thing would be like. Um, for me to be like held up as like, anyway, so, so the New York Times, <laughs> the story came, came out like six in the morning, like I'm getting calls, this is like before there's a lot of online stuff, like your face is on the cover of the New York Times, and then at seven in the morning it's like, uh, Billy, can you call me, like who, and at this time I was working for this incredible um, 
a black organizer woman who was like, uh, can we talk? Um, <laughs> uh, what on earth? Who are you? You know, and it was like, I, I basically got canceled before it was canceling. <laughs> it was like, uh, it, like the story looked like it's expose of like, we found out all the like, hypocritical things about this guy who claims to be so anti-racist. <laughs> and um, so that was hard, and I stopped writing and speaking for a couple of years, um, which is like the main way I was trying to change the world. And I basically, and I basically stopped talking a lot about race publicly after that. It's been like 20 years. Thanks, Andrew and Melissa, for making me talk about race again. <laughs> um, um, seriously, thank you. Um, <laughs> So, but I, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to like work behind the scenes to support organizing, to try to support black organizers and organizers of color and stru for structural change. Because it was like, all these white people would come up to me like, oh my God, you were so honest and like this changed my life. But I was like, this is not actually changing the conditions of my friends' lives. And at this point, I got more into politics because I was like, oh, George Bush won Florida by 537 votes, and then we got the Iraq War. I was like, I gotta get into big, big P politics to try to change these structures. So I, was, I started this thing called the League of Pissed Off Voters, and I was, it was like going great. Um, I was hiring all these organizers, mostly organizers of color, and here, the, second big, the second big hardest thing is that I was a terrible boss because I didn't want to be an oppressive white boss. A, a, like, bad manager. So I was a terrible manager. Cause, um, and so, and what I realized from this experience was that, you know, I had all these critiques of, like, white people and white men are responsible for all the genocide and murder and rape and stuff, and that evil is in us, and what would we have done if we were alive in slavery? You know, how would we have been any different from those other white people? And what I realized is that I also internalized a really deep sense of unworthiness and self-hatred. And, you know, that was like, you know, I was like obsessing about not being a bad white person instead of doing my job as an executive director. And so I was like, okay. The, actually like feeling bad about myself and, and a lot of white people in Western Mass are like, ah, you know. Um, <laughs> so, so I was like, wait, I actually, you know what I mean? So we, I, I actually have to love myself to love other people. I actually have to empower myself to empower other people. It's more complicated than that. But anyway, <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. So so I feel, I feel pretty proud because I feel like I've come a long way in these 30 years of trying to, um, trying to be a good white person. Um, and, and I've focused my energy on money and power and structural change. Um, so I uh, started this thing called the Movement Voter Project, which some of you have know about, which we're basically, you know, we've moved like over $30 million in the last few years, mostly to organizers of color in battleground states who are both organizing their own communities. We moved like the first money to, to Dream Defenders, which responded after Trayvon was killed, and to Black Lives Matter and Black Voters Matter, and the Flint water crisis, and Ferguson, and organizers on the front lines who are also building power to kick out the prosecutor, and the sheriff, and the governor, and, and it's powerful, beautiful work, and, and we have a 35-person staff now that, that like, I'm, I'm able to do a good, a good job <laughs> as a manager of an organization, um, and, and I live here in Northampton, which, where I never thought I'd live, um, and I have white children, um, <laughs> which is... It's <laughs> still sort of like confusing <laughs> to me. <laughs> but, um, but, and my six year old daughter and I, um, we talk about race and gender and politics all the time. And my two year old, Isaac, who's, who's only, um, who goes to a com almost completely white school, um, was looking at the refrigerator the other day. We have these refrigerator magnets. Um, 
And he looked at this picture of this black Muslim woman and said, Auntie Laura? Who looks nothing like the, wo the woman in the picture. And I was like, oh my God, I'm raising this white child to think that wh whiteness is so, in this place where whiteness is so normalized. Um, and and I, got, I got really worried about raising white children in this, this intensely white place. And, you know, it's like, they're, it, on the one hand, it's like they're both super privileged and sheltered. On the other hand, they're like deeply deprived and kind of warped by this like white world. And so, so what I want is, um, is for Western Mass to be this beloved community that's kind of like this room. Um, and that is a place where I, I want for myself to be part of this beloved community. Um, and I want it for my kids, and I want it for you and your kids. Um, and I want this to be a place of movement that we can all be a movement together to make this place good and support our people on the front lines in Michigan and Wisconsin and Florida to, to stop the right-wing, white-lash political movement that's trying to take over our country and destroy everyone's lives. Um, and, and I just, I want that um, just like I wanted it when I was growing up. And I feel like this is the fight of our lives. We have a basically cold civil war happening. And I feel like we all need um, to have um, basically a beloved community movement together. Uh, you guys feel me on this? Um, from Western Mass to the world, drop mic. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Melissa and Andrew and Embrace Race for helping build this movement. Thank you.